Dr. David Perlmutter here. Welcome again to the Empowering Neurologist. We've been talking a lot on the program about the benefits of being on a ketogenic diet. We are seeing the ketogenic diet being at least explored in the actual interventional treatment of many diseases, including neurological issues like Alzheimer's and to a lesser extent, Parkinson's disease. Uh, there has been one study uh, way back in 2005 involving only five patients uh, with Parkinson's, but nonetheless, those being put on a ketogenic diet had a dramatic improvement in terms of functionality. Well, it looks like uh, I've got some great news for you. A new study was just published, uh, and it involved 38 individuals uh, on a ketogenic diet with some very, very powerful uh, results. Uh, in terms of their functionality. So today we are going to talk to the author of that study. His name is Dr. Matthew Phillips. Uh, Dr. Phillips was raised in Canada, but now works full-time in uh, Hamilton, New Zealand, where we will speak to him. He completed his general medicine and specialist uh, tr specialty training in neurology uh, in Melbourne, Australia. His research is involved in exploring uh, the feasibility as well as the effectiveness of various dietary interventions in creating changes in metabolism and exploring whether or not these changes in metabolism will lead to improvements in terms of symptoms, function, and quality of life for people with uh, various neurological degenerative conditions like Parkinson's and like Alzheimer's. So we're going to talk to him today about his new publication that just came out in the journal Movement Disorders. Here we go. Well, okay. Hello, Dr. Phillips. Hi, David. How are you? I'm just great. Thank you for joining us. Again, it's, it's 8 a.m. where you are, right? Yeah, it's 8.30, so close enough. Good enough. All right. Well, uh, I was uh, very taken uh, this summer, as you know, the whole, how the whole thing went down was really quite remarkable. And I met your dad, and he told me what you were up to. And uh, I think he just sort of mentioned in passing uh, that, you know, my son's involved in ketogenic diet and something called Parkinson's. And I, I don't know how these things end up happening, but, uh, you know, because it's something that I've been really quite involved in over many years. And truthfully, we haven't really seen any good interventional trial except for the 2005 trial, which really was just a proof of concept. Uh, of five individuals who did in fact have, as you know, a, a fairly significant improvement. And what we're talking about for our viewers, again, is the notion of your implementation of a ketogenic diet in a group of, I think it was 38 patients with Parkinson's disease. So what I'd like to do is uh, first just maybe talk about um, what provoked you to look beyond medication and to look at something uh, nutritional as it relates to this disease. Okay, that's that's a bit of a long story, but uh, basically um, I'm from Canada and I trained in Australia. And when I finished those many years of training, I was a bit, um, I, I just felt I hadn't found my way in terms of what specialty I wanted to do. Um, as a neurologist, I could have specialized in stroke or epilepsy or Parkinson's itself or anything else, but Really, none of them seem quite right. And I, to be honest, I wanted to specialize in a therapy rather than a disease. But I didn't know of any such therapy at the time. So I, I, took, a, I took three years off and I did a, you know, a fair bit of work during that time and a lot of travel and a lot of thinking. And uh, I came across um, you know, other people um, doing different kinds of work. Um, I came across some of your videos and, and you know, the work of... Uh, particularly Dominic D'Agostino and Jason Fung and, and other like-minded people, Susan Messino, that it really intrigued me that maybe maybe there was a therapy that could could be used uh, in multiple conditions. And the more I got into the whole uh, approach of diet modification, not just to prevent but also to treat neurological disease, the more fascinated I became. And, yeah, it just uh, – spiraled on from there and, and, and resulted in a, you know, a passion, I suppose, and here I am. So you embraced the, from per, likely a biochemical perspective, what a ketogenic diet can do, what ketones can do in the brain, 
Uh, you know, this is not news. It dates back to the 1960s uh, in terms mm. of powering up mitochondria, etc. And you then took it upon yourself to uh, arrange a an interventional trial of uh, a group of patients with Parkinson's disease. And these individuals in your study were not on medication, as I recall. And you compared them to a low-fat diet. What? Uh, tell us more about the design of your study, and then we'll talk about your findings. Sure. So um, I guess it stemmed from the 2005 um, study you mentioned by uh, Theodore Van Italy, who um, I believe he's well into his 90s now. But I was quite inspired by that study where he uh, they started with seven patients, ended up with five patients finishing the four weeks of the of the ketogenic diet, and I think two improved by 20% of their motor scores, another two by about 45, and one by like 80. And it was, you know, an average sort of 40, 45%. I thought that was just too um, significant to ignore. So for this trial, what I realized was lacking was um, a randomized controlled trial in this condition, and actually pretty much any adult condition, even epilepsy, there's no good... Um, randomized control trial in adults with epilepsy. There's several in children. Uh, so, um, what I want, you know, what I wanted to do was create um, a ketogenic diet that I hoped people with Parkinson's could could adhere to and, and hopefully even enjoy, and uh, a low fat control diet because that's the one that still has the most momentum in the mainstream medical establishment. Uh, and so, uh, unfortunately. It, it was quite difficult to do a controlled diet as a diet as usual. And actually, um, this this is where uh, a lot of people who do medication-based trials have difficulty because the standard for a medication-based randomized trial is a double-blinded placebo trial where you, you have two groups, one getting a medication and one getting a, you know, a placebo, a fake tablet in, in essence. And that nobody knows, the patients don't know what they're getting, and nor do the people assessing them know what they're on. And that's good for medications. But in diet, you can't do that because you can't blind a person to their diet. People will know if they're taking in lots of fat or lots of carbohydrate in general. So uh, the way you have to run a diet trial, uh, if, you, if you do it like a medication trial and, and you know, you do a control, uh, control, it's diet as usual, then there'll be no expectation of benefit because why on earth would you get better when you just keep eating what you've always eaten? Uh, whereas the intervention group on the ketogenic diet or whatever diet you're testing would, of course, have an expectation of benefit just because it's different. So you have to modify the control diet a bit in a diet trial to, to create an expectation of benefit and, and try to make that expectation equal across both groups. That's so, so that you get... Um, you know, if you get a placebo effect, it affects both groups, and thus any differences between the two groups can't be due to placebo effect because you've applied some expectation of benefit to both groups. So that was what we tried to do with our low-fat control diet. On top of that, protein really affects Parkinson's, uh, specifically levodopa, the medication, the main one. And we had um, we had 47 patients uh, commence the trial, and most of them were actually on medication. Only a few were not. And so in order to make sure that we didn't have, you know, if, if you have a lot of protein, it will interfere with levodopa absorption. And so if, say, the low-fat diet had had uh, a higher protein content than the ketogenic arm, then a valid criticism would have been, well, the ketogenic arm improved because they had lower protein and their levodopa was more effective valid criticism. So we had to control for that by making protein absolutely equal between groups. It was not easy and necessitated that we create a low-fat control group strictly controlled for protein and so um, a bit more modified than a normal control. Uh, yeah, just, so that uh, those are, you know, sort of two of the challenging aspects of it, I suppose. Well, yeah. in looking at uh, your results, I, it does look as if the, uh, you know, the, the ketogenic group clearly developed ketosis. I mean, you know, you were very uh, able to demonstrate that. But more importantly, uh, at least in terms of looking at the unified Parkinson's disease rating scale, uh, you had some very intriguing findings. Can you walk us through those? Sure. So I wanted, we wanted, uh, the Van Italy study looked at motor scores and uh, that was that was awesome. The, the 
Parkinson's, um, it, it is a complicated condition, as you know, David. It uh, has motor symptoms, which we all learn about in medical school, tremor, uh, slowness of movement, bradykinesia, which is a, is a typical kind of slowness. Uh, it's, a, it's a reduction in amplitude of movements as well as slowness. And um, rigidity and uh, gait instability. However, uh, and that's what sort of the, the um, Van Italy looked at, the motor symptoms. But there's a whole bunch more to Parkinson's. And the reason is that Parkinson's doesn't just affect uh, the part of the brain responsible for motor um, you know, m- movements. Um, there's a small part in the brainstem called the substantia nigra that people uh, focus on as the problem in Parkinson's. And that's true. The neurons in that region, they tend to die off. However, uh, it's, it's a disease of neurons everywhere in the body. And in fact, uh, there's a decent evidence showing it may commence in the neurons in the gut, the enteric nervous system, and uh, possibly uh, the olfactory neurons responsible for smell. And in addition to that, it will affect it affects neurons uh, that innervate the heart, uh, the bladder, uh, and throughout the brain. So Parkinson's is a disease of, um, of, of, of neurons everywhere. And uh, that's why the, you get these motor symptoms, but you also get this huge array of non-motor symptoms. And non-motor symptoms are things like um, pain syndromes, uh, cognition problems, especially later on, bladder dysfunction, which is is, uh, a real problem for some people. Fatigue, um, depression is about 50% prevalent in Parkinson's, anxiety syndromes, and the list goes on. And it's these non-motor symptoms that dominate the quality of life in people with Parkinson's. Most people, they, they present with a, a, a small tremor or um, something along the lines of the motor symptoms. But as the condition progresses, the non-motor symptoms become more and more pr- uh, prevalent, more dominant. And <clears throat> certainly what, uh, what people really have struggle with later on are those non-motor symptoms. And in addition to that, levodopa, which is our gold standard medication for Parkinson's for, you know, half a century, it, while it generally treats the motor symptoms well, it doesn't have, uh, it has far l- less success with uh, particular non-motor symptoms, uh, in particular things like fatigue and, and sleep, uh, sort of uh, daytime sleepiness, um, some of the pain syndromes, it's not good, Your bladder dysfunction, it's not very good, and it doesn't help. Uh, apathy and cognitive dysfunction much either. Uh, so I'm ra- I feel like I'm rambling on a bit here. No, but, but I mean, I think the, the picture you paint is actually very intriguing. And that is, you know, the, the model has focused, as you rightly stated, on this unique uh, pars compacta substantia nigra defect of dopaminergic transmission, and we'll put the dopamine back and everything will be fine. Next patient. I mean, it's quite similar to the cholinergic hypothesis of Alzheimer's, where it was noted there was decreased uh, acetylcholine, it will give some cholinesterase inhibitor, and next thing you know, we've treated Alzheimer's. And neither really is treating the disease process. Uh, What you're describing is classic, straightforward symptom management based on a really focused, dare I say, myopic understanding of this disease. And, you know, even years ago, we, we noted that there was a mitochondropathy noted or mitochondrial dysfunction even in platelets that could be uh, seen in patients with Parkinson's. And you're again correct in you know, describing that this is far more than a motor issue, that there are bladder issues. Uh, constipation might be the, the first uh, symptom that people complain of. Uh, but you know, cognitive issues, skin issues are very common. People don't talk about it, but I think it's taking us to a place of embracing. In fact, this is a big overriding uh, problem in the body, and let's address it like that, which is what a dietary intervention seems to do. Absolutely. And so, uh, yeah, that's why we wanted to check. Uh, we, had, we looked at motor symptoms and scores, like Van Italy, but we also looked at the non-motor symptoms. Um, and the scale we used for this uh, – modified um, sort of disease, uh, Parkinson's disease rating scale. It's sort of the, you know, the, the touted as, uh, as one of the best, if not the best, for rating 
uh, the, the severity of the condition it's in, in its entirety. And um, yeah, so that, that's what we focused on that. And uh, what we found was, was quite interesting. I think, uh, as you rightly say, the non-motor symptoms in the ketogenic group uh, really improved quite a bit more than the low fat group. And I, I must say, we treated both groups, uh, you know, exactly the same as, as much as we could, except for the fat to carbohydrate ratio. I mean, we, yes, we kept protein constant, but we also, um, we had, um, ways to help, help people with the diet. We had uh, weekly, um, videos that we put online. We had emails twice a day. We played both diets up as potentially beneficial to equal degrees. And our assessors were, um, you know, scale certified neurologists who had no idea which diet the people were on. And yeah, and we, we even assessed them as, you know, Parkinson's, um, the motor symptoms, the mood and the effects of the levodopa can vary even from hour to hour. And so we had to assess these patients, uh, over the eight week period of the trial on the same day of the week and at the exact same time. And I mean, t within 10 minutes, and we made sure that they took their levodopa and all their other medications at the exact same time before each session. We verified that they did this. The patients were amazing in this trial. Well, your yeah. results were really uh, outstanding. And, uh, you know, it's um, you, you, you found improvement across so many domains. And it, it's, it takes your breath away a bit when you talk about the success of this salubrious dietary intervention anyway, good for them anyway. I mean, when you watch their A1Cs come down, etc. cetera. Uh, but that said, um, why do you, or, or are you um, noticing that A, there might be pushback, or B, people just in the field don't seem to want to uh, embrace what you've discovered? That's a, that's a really good question, and uh, <laughs> it's something... I, I anticipated and um, in some ways has come to fruition. I guess I just want to, can I take a step back? I think in order to do a trials like this, and I certainly don't, you know, want to bring any light on myself here. I think you have to be, um, to step out of the framework that we're taught, you have to be perhaps a little bit brave, and, and I think definitely a little bit mad. And um, when you do that, when you, when you um, take your ship a little bit away from harbor, uh, you know, out into the sea a bit of exploration and in terms of the, uh, a different concept, which is what ships are built for anyways, then you're going to get pushed back. Um, and I'm, I think that over the two and a half years – of the, you know, the conception and uh, execution and, and writing up and publication of this trial. Uh, I think initially, uh, the, yeah, yes, I mean, there was, of course, uh, blowback from uh, call, some colleagues, some were very supportive, some colleagues and other people in, in the medical field. And uh, initially, I, it was difficult for me to adjust to that. But I think over the two and a half years, I've actually learned to become uh, – more tolerant and often a someone with a contradictory point of view has a valid point of view and you have to consider it and actually use it to make your own. I've used some of those views to actually, I hope made the, made the trial design better and uh, you know, a lot of valid criticism, but uh, in well, terms of the public, you. You yeah, know, go, I, ahead. go I, ahead. I can tell you, I know what it's like being the odd man out, but moving forward yes. nonetheless. Um, let's go to a place uh, for a moment of the, uh, biochemistry mechanistically, why, why do you suppose you had the results that you had, which were really quite outstanding? Thank you, Dave. Uh, I think there are two approaches. One approach is to try and get your theory tight and then apply it to um, reality. And uh, that's uh, where I rely a lot on the groundwork of people like, um, uh, you know, Dominic D'Agostino and other uh, like-minded people who who, who do all this uh, basic research uh, in animal models 
uh, that allows us to take it forward. But my approach here was I'm not sure what the diet will do for Parkinson's in people, if anything. And so I'm just going to try and apply it as best as I can to, to the people, help them through it, help make it as tolerable and affordable and simple. Remember, you're talking about people with a neurodegenerative condition, simple as possible, and let's see what happens. And, and let's be unbiased and let's just measure everything. That's why I had four primary outcomes. Let's just measure motor, non-motor symptoms, mo- uh, medication complications, everything. Let's see what happens. Now, um, so, so my answer to your question is I don't know. However, there are, there are good reasons to think that a ketogenic diet, of course, could help Parkinson's. One of the big ones, as we know, it increases intracellular ATP availability for uh, cells in general. And that's one of the uh, motivations or thoughts behind its use in the key, uh, for epilepsy. Uh, it also may stimulate mitochondrial biogenesis. And so so it, it, it generally increases energy availability. And if energy problems are, are a part or a big part of Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, other similar conditions, that's a good thing. In Parkinson's in particular, if you do, if you look at uh, human autopsy studies, there is a, there's a complex of proteins in all mitochondria, and the mitochondria, as I'm sure your viewers all know, are like the batteries of the cells, and they make the energy that keep everything going. Uh, within those, there's a complex of proteins called the electron transport chain. It consists of four or five complexes, depending on how you want to define it. And uh, electrons flow down that chain and produce the ATP energy for all cells. In Parkinson's, uh, on autopsy studies, complex one is um, damaged or inhibited or reduced by about 30%. And that is actually for a neuron, which um, has a cell, is a cell type that has among the highest energy demands in the entire body, if not the highest. Uh, then that's a significant uh, 30% reduction will will really cause a problem in ATP production. The ketogenic diet's power, the ketones produced by it, can actually bypass complex one completely and go straight to complex two, as been shown in in previous uh, work. And so the theory there was maybe if we create enough of these ketones that they can go straight to complex two, uh, improve the energy deficit, and um, make people better. Well, you know, the, the mitochondrial uh, defect has been talked about for a long time. The complex mm. one issue was, of course, the underlying uh, reason for the coenzyme Q10 studies. So one would wonder moving forward, what might the, co- uh, the contribution be to higher levels of coenzyme Q10 along with a ketogenic diet so that uh, you can, to some degree, ameliorate the complex one dysfunction and then amplify uh, ATP production with the boost from the ketones. So uh, now that you've had this, uh, these very positive results, uh, what's next? Is there a larger study or what do you plan to do? I thought about this hard uh, the last little while. I do have several people with different conditions on a ketogenic diet, case reports and things that I plan to write up soon. Um, but what we're planning now is a larger study, um, but it's going to be an Alzheimer's disease. And uh, I don't want to get too excited because uh, these studies are extremely difficult. I mean, for me anyway, it's extremely difficult to implement. There's getting the ethics, uh, there's getting the funding, there's getting uh, a team, a good team together. I got lucky with this Parkinson's study. I got a great nutritionist, uh, wonderful colleagues um, support supporting me as my co-investigators, that is. And so you have to get enough patients uh, together who are interested in this. Fortunately, that doesn't seem to be too hard. People are interested. And then you have to run the trial properly, and and there are many ways it could, <laughs> it could all go pear-shaped. So, so the next plan is, anyways, to try in 2019 to run a bigger study, a longer study in Alzheimer's disease. Um, we're, we're creating a diet that doesn't have to be so uh, as restrictive because we don't have to absolutely match the protein between the two groups. And I'm really, people with these conditions, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, uh, they, 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 as part of the process, perhaps have a, have a, a real uh, sweet tooth and, and a need for some uh, sweet kinds of uh, foods. And so... Uh, we're uh, right now working very hard to create, uh, in addition, you know, to 
healthy vegetable based uh, foods and whatnot to create healthy um, sweet keto desserts for these people that so so just to, it's all about trying to make people there's no point in having an invent, intervention if 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 uh, people can't tolerate it and that's been the Achilles heel of, of the ketogenic diet for a hundred years that's Wilder uh, created it in the 1920s is is it may work well for epilepsy but a lot of people struggle because it's not only socially difficult, but it, it's it's difficult to enjoy. And I really believe it can be difficult. Uh, it can be easy to enjoy. It, it's a it's a great way um, to 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 live. And as you say, it helps your diabetes markers, and it's great against uh, obesity and other uh, you know conditions. Well, treating too. Alzheimer's with a ketogenic diet, <laughs> who knew? Um, yeah. I, <laughs> Um, I would say that, uh, you know, some have argued that our uh, Paleolithic ancestors prior to the advent of agriculture were pretty much in a low grade of ketosis all the time. So they were protected, uh, that that was the diet that helped reduce inflammation, helped power their cognitive development and cognitive function moment to moment. So uh, it may not be as novel as a, an idea as some people would, would like it to be. So. Congratulations on your work, and I think it was so incredibly serendipitous that we uh, got connected this way. I mean, it, 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 it's just amazing how that all ended up uh, playing out. So thank you for your time today. Thank you, David. It's been a pleasure. Okay. Well, what a dedicated individual uh, putting together these trials, looking forward to a, a new trial, uh, interventional trial in uh, actually treating uh, Alzheimer's patients by putting them on a ketogenic diet, hoping to uh, override this uh, mitochondrial energy uh, defect that seems to be so prevalent in uh, that and other neurodegenerative conditions. So uh, kudos to, to uh, Dr. Uh, Phillips for doing such great work. We really look forward to hearing more from him in the years to come. Thanks for joining me. If you want to get more information about ketogenic diet, obviously go to our website, drperlmutter.com. I would also indicate that we are sending out a free uh, informational newsletter every week. If you go to drperlmutter.com, you can sign up for that as well. Until next time, bye for now.